Hey, hello, and welcome to another exciting, exciting edition of Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, I really do have a long overdue guest this time. I, I spend a whole lot of time um, at his research facility on the Big Island and uh, get to see him passing by in the, in the quad once in a while when they're doing some filming or something, but uh, have yet to have him on the show. And, and it really is long overdue, but um, my guest today is Mr. Hank Rogers the head of Blue Planet Foundation and also Blue Planet Research. And, um, and he's got other famous uh, attributes too that I'll, I'll let him talk about himself a little bit. But uh, Hank, welcome to the show today. And I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that you do an awful lot of traveling around the world, but why don't you give uh, the viewers just, if they haven't met you before, just a little bit of your background. All right, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Stan. Uh, I really appreciate it. I was on Think Tech with Jay Fidel like years and years and years ago. This was probably, yeah, when I was at the Manoa Innovation. It's been a long time ago. Anyway, um, background, um, I'm originally from the Netherlands, eight, uh, 11 years in the Netherlands, eight years in New York, four years in Hawaii. I went to UH, learned to surf, uh, chased the world of Japan, started a computer game company, wrote the first role-playing game in Japan. Uh, ended up licensing the rights to a little game called Tetris. I went after the rights. I went to the Soviet Union and uh, befriended the guy who actually made the game. He's my partner till today. Um, made another company making um, mobile phone game companies. Uh, sorry, mobile phone games. Um, you know, in Honolulu. Um, sold that company for a bunch of money. Bought a ranch. Um, had a heart attack, found my missions in life, um, started a foundation working to end the use of carbon-based fuel. Um, I got three other missions and war. I make a back of life by going to the moon and Mars and beyond and figure out how the universe and, and do something about it. What well, now I don't, I don't have to buy the book now. <laughs> yeah, I just, I've had your whole life in like two minutes. That's awesome. That's right. That's, I think that's the quickest life story I've ever done. That is, that, that was pretty impressive. <laughs> But uh, I, I really appreciate you being on today. And, and I really have to say, I, I admire the work that Paul and the guys are doing up there on the Big Island and, um, and your efforts around the world globally to, uh, to work on cleaning up our environment, making it a better place, and um, hopefully, you know, just making the world a better place. I know that you're more of a doer than a, a talker, as evidenced by your, your little monologue there. You, you'd rather do it than talk about it. Um, and, and I have to say, I, I did see the History Channel story on your trip to Russia, or Soviet Union, actually, because it was still Soviet Union back yeah, then. Um, and your exploits and, and how you met your partner, got the, the license to Tetris out. And as a backstory, I understand you actually brought him to the United States after the fall of the Soviet Union. Could you just talk about that for a second? Um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, it, it's... He needed to get out of the Soviet Union. Um, he wasn't getting anything for Tetris, even though he created the game. It all went to the people. And, and so, you know, I basically, I got him out. He lives in Seattle. He worked for me for a while. Then he worked for Microsoft for a while. And now he's just collecting royalties. Did he become an American citizen? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Outstanding. Outstanding. Absolutely. He's become an American citizen. And I tried to convince him to vote. But he, he doesn't believe in politics or politicians. He says they're all liars. <laughs> I have to tend to agree with them on that one wholeheartedly. But hey, uh, again, traveling, you've been doing a bunch of traveling. And is it Bhutan that you go to quite a bit? OK, so I've been to over 60, I don't know, 65 countries and counting. Um, I used to travel around the, before COVID. Mm -hmm. I was going around the world at least four times a year. I mean, around the world. Uh, trip tickets. I have been to Bhutan three times. Yes, it's a wonderful place. I'm friends with the ex prime minister of Bhutan and the king of Bhutan. He's my Facebook friend. Oh, all know. right. <laughs> but you, you've actually tried to take some innovation, particularly the third, not, I don't want to call them third world countries, underdeveloped countries, um, and trying to get them to stop deforestation, um, maybe using um, hydrogen to or methane from, from farm waste products to cook with instead of deforesting. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh. So you're, you're, I don't know, that's not my life story, it's somebody okay. else's story. So what I did 
did what I did do is I talked to both the prime minister and the king about uh, bringing hydrogen to uh, okay. Wuhan. Why? Um, they have all the, the how can I say, water, hydropower that you could ever want. Mm. Uh, in Timpu, the capital, electricity costs two cents per kilowatt hour. If you're outside Timpu, electricity is free. Wow. Okay. All right. So that's the good news. Where they make their, uh, besides the tourism, where they make their uh, foreign currency is they sell electrons to India. So that's where the money, that's where they get their money. Now, where does the money go? Their money goes back to India when they buy gasoline and diesel, which has to be trucked into Bhutan. <clears throat> and that's an uphill battle because Bhutan is on the way to Tibet from India. You're talking about bringing stuff uphill. So it's gotta right. be expensive. So I said, you know, um, you should be doing electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles for your inside of your towns or your cities. And you should be using hydrogen vehicles for your trucks and buses. And you can make the hydrogen out of the run of the river electricity. Your electricity is so cheap. And uh, actually um, the king <laughs> who was an like Oxford grad uh, said, you know, um, the hydrogen trucks and buses, they're too expensive. Everything is still too expensive. And I said, okay, um, I will figure it out on the big island of Hawaii. And when we have the solution, the trucks and buses and, and the station, then I'll come back and I'll bring that solution to Bhutan. So that's the, that's the actual story. Okay. That's, that's a long time ago. I did 10 years in, you know, you've been talking about it. So you say I, I, I act, but I'm, uh, and, I, and I don't talk, but actually this, this hydrogen conversation has been going on for far too long. I agree. It I agree. It happened ages ago and we're, and we're still waiting. I agree. But you're right on the money. If they have hydroelectric power uh, cheap, man, there's no reason why they couldn't be using hydrogen for cooking, hydrogen for their transportation. Um, and as it turns out nowadays, even Airbus is looking at hydrogen for aviation. Um, big shipping companies are looking at hydrogen for um, container ship transit, you know, uh, changing out their, their propulsion systems. And, you know, you think about a container ship, how much fossil fuel it throws, you know, carbon into the atmosphere um, on a round trip between L.A. and Hawaii. And uh, it's it's tons and tons and tons that you can mitigate if you use hydrogen instead. So uh, you're right. It's not happening fast enough. But, you know, around the world, there is a lot going on in hydrogen and Europe and Asia especially are, uh, are doing a lot in hydrogen. Um, can you tell us if you're, you know, running into that same feeling that you see it increasing, or at least it's becoming more popular around the world? Well, absolutely. Japan has dedicated, has said they're going to switch to a hydrogen economy. I mean, they import fossil fuel that runs, I mean, besides the nukes that they have, they don't actually have a source of energy uh, right. inside of Japan. So they import everything. And, you know, I, God bless their little hearts. They were going to run the Olympics off hydrogen. And it, it's a story and everybody's buying it. And so the people are kind of mentally ready for it. Uh, in, in this country, it still feels like people say, oh, it's dangerous. The Hindenburg, yeah. you know, the hydrogen bomb. And it's like, hey, hello. When's the last time you actually looked into this? Fossil fuels are way more dangerous than hydrogen will ever be. And, and you drive your fossil fuel car you keep your propane tanks inside your house and you, you do it on, put them under your barbecue, you put them in the trunk of your car. Now that's dangerous. So um, I was on a, on a talk show in uh, <laughs> Singapore. I arrive in Singapore, the next morning I'm, in, I'm on a talk show. They ask me, what can we do? We don't have uh, room for solar. We don't have uh, wind. You know, how can we go renewable? And I said, well, I, I really know nothing about Singapore, but I, I'm gonna guess. I'm going to guess that you're importing fossil fuel and that's how you get your electricity from someplace. You know, there's Indonesia, there's a whole bunch of sources nearby. If you want to get off of that addiction, what I think you should do is you should go and build a, a, a wind farm or a solar farm somewhere in Australia. There's so much outback out there with so much wind and so much solar in places where there are no people. All you need to do is you could build your own infrastructure, make the hydrogen, bring it to bring it to Singapore, and you would be a clean economy. Yeah. How hard can that be? Well, you know, it's it's funny, just in the short time and having you describe Bhutan and Singapore, 
and Singapore is population dense, just like Oahu is. And Bhutan is kind of rural, kind of like the outer island, neighbor islands are in Honolulu. And we have the same energy conundrum where we need the power on Oahu, but the renewable sources are probably more available on the neighbor islands. Um, so in Hawaii, um, I, I personally, when I look at the numbers, I go, there's no way on Oahu we can put enough solar panels uh, and probably don't want to put a bunch of big wind turbines all over the island, um, you know, to, to make enough renewable. But we do have um, renewables within the state, both hydroelectric. On the big island, I think hydroelectric's under underappreciated. Uh, and I think even on Oahu, we used to have sugar cane flumes and pineapple flumes all over the island that you could put in stream hydro um, in at several elevations and be generating maybe enough electricity for 100 or 200 houses at a time and it adds up but at any rate here in hawaii if you put geothermal into the mix and you put hydrogen in as the energy storage piece doesn't that seem like the ideal way to get off fossil fuels in this state i've had i've been giving this speech for like years and years and years there's enough there's enough um, geothermal energy under the big island to to power hawaii for the rest of time and it's better than that I bet we could export hydrogen to Japan. We we're the we could be the mecca of of hydrogen. You know, geothermal is such a huge power source. It's such a huge power source. And if we manage to, I don't know how many gigawatts we can get out of it, it wouldn't make a difference to the mountains. It wouldn't make a difference. In fact, it might cool it down a little bit. But <laughs> You know there is so much energy down there it's it's hard to fathom right and so uh, you know i don't think that even if we did our best effort that we would act actually scratch maybe one percent off of that geothermal power source on the big island um i'm sorry that you know that that it's such a controversial issue when, when it comes to i don't know um culture or religion or all those things that get in the way um but at some point, we're going to have to like work with it because what we're doing now is we're living with something which is destroying the aina. You know, we're 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 living with oil. We import five billion dollars a year of oil. We're living with coal. I mean, that's going to go away pretty soon. We did a pretty good job, um, but I mean, we live with that, and it's destroying our coral. It's it's creating hurricanes. Mark my words, we're gonna get hit by one of those hurricanes one of these days, just like Iniki. You know, there you roll the dice. Each time a hurricane comes at Hawaii, you roll the dice that it's not gonna cause major damage. But look at what happened to Puerto Rico. I went to Puerto Rico, and that place is a mess. And it's because all the electricity is being moved around on these long ass cables, and they go down in hurricanes. And we are not like right around the corner next to Florida where we can get equipment from Florida to help us out. We are far away and it's gonna take a long time for us to recover. So we should start thinking about how to be resilient now. Now, moving the hydro, moving electricity from, from the big island to Oahu, I think once we start thinking about exporting hydrogen, we can export it to Oahu, keep it all inside the state. We don't need to go anywhere else. We're on the same wavelength, my friend. I agree 110% because uh, it makes more sense than an undersea cable. It, um, you know, we've even talked to Mitch Ewan over at HNEI about uh, doing a, a um, dirigible that could move hydrogen between the islands um, and also move cargo at the same time. So I think that'd be an awesome, awesome project to uh, to really look at that. I know you know Richard Ha. I knew you have a lot of visitors at yeah, the ranch. No, Richard. <laughs> yeah, he's he's actually trying to work with the Hawaiian community to get them more accepting of um, geothermal, uh, if as long as it's safe and clean and you know not necessarily a carbon copy of what we had. That's twenty or thirty year old technology so far that, that could use some improving. But there's modern thought, ways. I was in uh, in Iceland visiting their geothermal facilities, and it, it looks like our convention center. Yeah. Big glass front with a coffee shop and a, a museum about the history of geothermal and how it changed Reykjavik, which used to have a cloud of coal coal uh, dust over it all the time. Now they get all of their heat, their hot water, from geothermal, 
And so they asked me, where are you from? And I said, oh, oh I'm from Hawaii. And he said, oh, we've had a visitor from Hawaii. And they looked it up. It was Richard Ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, I've been actually, I've been to Iceland probably four or five times myself with the military. We used to do oh. alert over there with, and yeah. we were part of an air defense system and we would do alert over there, but it's a beautiful place. The joke was there's a beautiful woman behind every tree, um, but there's just no trees. <laughs> Yeah. But there are there are some pretty ladies there, I have to admit. But back on the energy side, let's let's actually that's a good spot to take a break. I'm I'm getting pimped by the um tech uh, think tech folks that I need to take a little break here. So we'll be back in uh, 60 seconds with Hank Rogers from Blue Planet and talk some more hydrogen, some more energy. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man here, having a great talk with Mr. Hank Rogers. Actually, we didn't prep for this thing, so we're kind of all over the place, but it's a cool conversation. A lot of surprises in here, but um, Hank has been uh, traveling a lot around the world. And one of the things that uh, he did here locally, like I say, he's more action than talk is, he decided um, that he wanted to have his property on the Big Island off the grid. And so, hey, can you just talk a little bit about how that happened and some of the serendipitous things that occurred out of that out of that? Um, yes. So, you know, it all stemmed from um, you know, the foundation we passed uh, this legislation that helped the solar industry in Hawaii, and so solar energy industry boomed. At some at the peak, we had like 200 solar installers in, you know, in Hawaii, and then the electric company said, "Whoa, uh, we can't handle that much on the grid." And they, and they started saying, we're not going to allow you to grid tie. That's what happened to me in Honolulu. And I'm, I'm thinking, what the hell? You know, I, we went to all this trouble to create this business for the solar industry, and now they're stuck. And so I, I said, well, how can we get around that? Started thinking about it. And the answer for me, which I also think is the answer for the future for everyone, is to go off grid. You know, what the, the idea is that you make your own electricity uh, wherever you live. And how do you do that? I mean, solar or wind? Um, and how do you get through the night? Or how do you get through, through periods when there is no wind? And the answer is you have to store that energy. So then we started looking into batteries. And the, you know, we, we first we got into vanadium redox flow batteries and they were horrible. Uh, it's a horrible chemical and there's still horrible chemicals sitting at my ranch somewhere uh, waiting for a disaster to happen. Um, and I said, you know, after that year of vanadium redox, I said to my guys, listen, the next batteries, because the company was that, that brought us this stuff was bought by the Chinese and we never heard from them again. I said, okay, the next battery is going to be, we're gonna buy it from a company that's still gonna be around 20 years from now. That's the first thing. The second thing is it's going to be a benign chemistry. In other words, I don't wanna, I don't wanna have another set of like, terrible garbage sitting at my ranch sometime in the future. So we have to find a benign chemistry. And we did our homework and we ended up with Sony. Sony turned out to be the first company that uh, made lithium ion batteries in the first place in 1991. And then they came up uh, with a new, new chemistry in, uh, in 2009, lithium iron phosphate. Now the difference between the other uh, lithium ion batteries, which are in my phone, in my laptop, in my Tesla, uh, is they're mostly lithium, nickel, cobalt, manganese. Now, cobalt, cobalt comes from a war zone uh, and is mined by kids. 
And manganese, they're talking about scraping the bottom of the ocean to get manganese nodules, which is another ridiculous thing. Um, lithium and iron and phosphate, however, are all benign chemicals. And so we chose the Sony batteries. Um, they don't get hot. It's like, oh my gosh. You know, if you look at anything that's, that's using the NMC, the nickel cobalt manganese, you will find all kinds of stuff to keep them from overheating. And then still they get it wrong, like that Samsung Galaxy thing that caught on fire or, or those little uh, toys that you ride around on, like Segways. Uh, and every once in a while, one of those cars actually does catch on fire. And why is that? It's because it's basically an unstable chemistry. If you puncture it, if you overheat it, overcharge it, it will spontaneously combust. And that combustion is not something you can put out with a, with a fire extinguisher or water. It just keeps, it's like fireworks. The instruction to firefighters is stand back and wait till it's over. Now there's nothing you can do to, fer to lithium ferrous phosphate that will make that happen. And so it's the safest battery. They run cool. There's no parts in there to, that, no cooling system, no nothing. And it worked for me here at the ranch. And uh, I also took my house in Honolulu off grid because the electric company said, sorry, you're in a neighborhood that has too much solar already and you can't have solar on your roof. I said, well, I uh, hate to say this, but <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway. And uh, so we started doing it for other people, you know, friends and family, that kind of thing. And we ended up with a company. So we have a new company called, well, it's not that new anymore. It's already four or five years old now. Um, it's called Blue Planet Energy. And we do exclusively lithium iron phosphate battery systems. Uh, we went from servicing the Hawaii, um, basically the Hawaii market. Uh, all of them we realized, and then the reason I thought Hawaii is because Hawaii's got the most expensive electricity. So, and it's got all this solar and all this wind, so it should be the perfect place. And it kind of is, but it turns out there are a lot of people on the mainland who also want to get off grid or, or stay off grid. They're just not near. It's more expensive to take a line out to your property out in the boonies than it is for you to build your own energy system. And there's a lot of people living in those boonies. And when you have a hurricane or something, what's the first thing that fails? It's yeah. all those long lines yes. that are taken. And in California now, even if there's a, like any noise, there's going to be wind, the, the electric company will turn it off just in case. Yeah. They, they can't afford to have happen what happened. They got blamed for a bunch of forest fires, you know, a couple of, uh, I don't know how long ago it was, but now everybody realizes that. And, and you've got critical infrastructure. You've got medicine in pharmacy, pharmacies, you've got hospitals, you've got I don't know, police fire stations and all these water, things. water and pumping it, facilities, wastewater treatment facilities. These are all things that need to keep on going, uh, despite the fact that they, the grid has given up. And so we have <clears throat> over 200 dealers across the country. Now. And our biggest uh, deal to date has been to retrofit 200, oh no, sorry, 120 schools in Puerto Rico to work as emergency shelters because they all Perfect. failed after Maria. And so what we did was we put batteries in every school and the, the local uh, solar installers put solar on all the roofs. We worked with the, um, uh, the Red Cross, the Red Cross funded this whole project. And now this last time they had a, an earthquake and the shelters all worked. Perfect. So, I mean, it, and the, the, the price of this chemistry is going to come down. When you think about it, iron and phosphate are common elements as opposed to uh, cobalt and manganese. And so it's just a matter of time where we get the volume going and that's, that is starting to happen. So eventually I, I pr predict that our batteries will be cheaper. And so how many years has your ranch and your home on Oahu been off the, off the grid? So um, <clears throat> we took the, the ranch is like a little over seven years and uh, my, my home in Honolulu, um, we have a party every 4th of July. And the first one was when we disconnected from the grid. I had my granddaughter push a button, just like uh, I think Princess Kailani turned on the <laughs> switch for the- At Iolani uh, Palace. <laughs> Iolani Palace. I had my granddaughter do the same, push a button, and we were off grid. And we've been off grid ever since. Uh, so we have a party every year celebrating Energy Independence Day. Great. And no regrets, uh, I assume, based on how exciting you are 
I'm excited you are no, talking about it. No regrets. I mean, like our load has gotten bigger over time and I bought electric cars. So, so what we built there is not enough. Uh, we've got to add more panels and, and add more batteries, but that's a natural progression. So yeah, I mean, electric car, when you have an electric car, it's like having another house. house. Yeah, yeah. I, I try and I, I do that with folks. I say, how, how much power does your house draw? And they, they go, well, my electric bills, XXX. And I go, well, how much power does your house draw every day? Do you know? And most of them don't have any idea. And I said, well, if you look at your electric bill, it'll tell you your average, you know, like my house is 20 kilowatt hours a day, which is really pretty low on the average. But I go, if I had a car, it'd probably be like 25 kilowatt hours a day. So I'd, I'd have to put twice as much solar on my roof to just run my car and my house at the same time. So I try and make those kind of analogies, but um, it's, it's definitely makes you think about energy, makes you very conscious about your energy. Yeah, so the solution to the EV problem is that you should be charging your EV at work. Because that's the time when the grid has extra extra electricity, and so if you park in a garage somewhere and not charging your car during peak solar generation hours, you're wasting all that. We are wasting all right. that electricity. So it's just a management issue. Yeah, yeah. You could be helping Heco balance out their load if you used up all that electricity uh, from the solar panels that are in the buildings around you. Well, it's it's you know any solar field. So if, if you're going to take an island off grid, it's similar to what, to my situation at the ranch, you have to overbuild the solar yeah, because it's got to work on a cloudy day. So on a cloudy day, we, we kind of break even, but on a sunny day, we have all kinds of extra energy. And what the PPAs that the, the electric company has with all of their solar providers is when we say enough, you throw away the, the rest of the electricity that you're generating. Right. That is for curtailing. In a state where we spend five billion dollars a year on oil, and forty percent of that goes to making electricity, how dare we throw away electricity? It just I agree with no you. Sense. That is just, I think that's a crime. And so we we need to use that electricity at that time to power electric ve vehicles and to make hydrogen. And hydrogen is the backup uh, the backup fuel for yeah, for my ranch. We make hydrogen here when, when it's a sunny day. We make hydrogen, we store it, and then on a on a cloudy day, when it, sometimes when we don't have enough energy, then we basically get it back by sending the hydrogen into a fuel cell, and it charges our batteries. That's the way the world should work, and it's it's a environmentally benign all of it, and contrary to popular opinion, hydrogen is the safest gas that you can possibly work with. If there's a hydrogen leak. It's, it's like 14 times lighter than air. It escapes the room immediately. If you were in a hydrogen fire in a car, the hydrogen would be gone. And, and here's another goofy thing about hydrogen. I don't exactly know why this is, but if you have a hydrogen fire, you can put your hand right next to the hydrogen fire. You won't even feel the heat. There's no radiated heat. So that means it's a, it's a pretty crummy, uh, how can I say, campfire. But it's great if you're if you're in some place where there's a hydrogen fire, and it's really hard to set it on fire, by the way, because it's moving yeah. so fast. You have to you have to slow it down. Uh, so I think it's going to be hydrogen cooking. I think it's going to be the way to go. Yep, because that that flame where it does go is really hot, but it, it doesn't. It only up. goes right where you direct it. It goes where you direct it, and it's a wet flame. It doesn't create carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Yeah. It creates H two O. So it's keeping your vegetables and your whatever from drying out while yep. you cook. So yeah, one of the first things I learned when I started working at HCAT was that the word hydrogen is actually ancient Greece for water maker. Wow. <clears throat> so they even understood that 3000 years ago. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. But they didn't have electrolyzers. They didn't have, it's before. But it, you know what? I, completely blasted through 30 minutes on the show already. And I think I'm gonna to have to have you back on and we need to really uh, have a better conversation about some of the other things you've got in mind. Um, I know they're gonna put a spaceport on the big island some at some point. I'm sure there's a place for hydrogen there that we could talk about. So 
I want to thank you very much, Hank Rogers. It's um, and, and accept my apologies for not having you on sooner because uh, we're way overdue for this uh, this show. But thanks for being on, and um, I hope you come back uh, sometime in the not too distant future. We'll keep talking, especially about hydrogen. So better late than never. Right. The goal the goal is a world in which humanity and nature live in harmony. That's the ultimate goal for all of us. That's the perfect way to close the show, sir. And I thank you very much for your time. And to all the viewers, I'll see you next week, Tuesday, on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.